Thanks, Kirby. I still got some more. <laughs> okay, got th we're, we're going to be released now from the uh, university. We, they stuck us in, uh, they kept us in the camp for about 30 days, at least my family, because the Battle of Manila was going on. And if we went out into Manila, we probably would have got killed. The, son of the University of Santa Tomas was used as a medical aid station and a medical hospital. They brought in a lot of seriously wounded Filipino civilians, American soldiers, and anybody else that was uh, gunned down, as it were. Um, before I get to that, I was going to tell you about Liberation Night. Forgot. All right. February 3rd, 1945. Doug Douglas MacArthur was most impressed with the, uh, the raid on Cabanatuan, which was January 30th. So he, he bypassed his corps commander, Lieutenant General Kruger, and went to two of his divisional commanders, Major General Vern Mudge of the 1st Cavalry Division and General Major General Beitner of the 37th Infantry Division, which was a totally, very seriously undermanned National Guard division, about eight or 9,000 men. Uh, the 1st Cav was a regular Army unit, and they were, they were totally trained and totally mounted on equipment. He told these two generals, I want you to go to Manila, I want you to bounce off the nips, I want you to go around the nips, and I want you to get to Malacanang Palace, to the legislative buildings in Manila, and also liberate the internees at Santa Tomas. Well, Major General Mudge went immediately to his people, got seven to 800 men, mostly from the 8th Regiment of the 1st Cav, put them on trucks, and he also got a company of tanks, Sherman tanks from the uh, 44th Tank Battalion. They started off at one minute after midnight on the 1st of February and headed to Manila, 100 miles through enemy territory. It took them 66 hours straight, no sleep, to get to Manila. Um, they fought and they drove to Manila. They were on the outskirts of Manila, they were in three cereals, and they were lost. They didn't know uh, where to go in Manila because they didn't uh, have a map, as it were. Well, they did have a map, but it wasn't accurate. So Captain Kowalko and his sergeant, two Filipino um, soldiers, as it were, rode or took them to uh, Santa Tomas. One serial went to Malacanang Palace. They f got there, I'm not qu quite sure how. Another serial went to liberate the legislative buildings on the other side of the Pasig River, but they couldn't get there because of the Japanese. The, th the second serial came to Santa Tomas. They had six Sherman tank, M4 tanks. They got out to the outskirts, uh, they got out to the gate of Santa Tomas. Uh, somebody, some Japanese on the inside of the gate threw a grenade over and mortally wounded Captain Kowalko, unfortunately. Kowalko, yeah. Kolaiko. Kolaiko. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, he was later taken into Santa Tomas and given medical aid, but he died. Immediately, the tanks uh, started over the gates of Santa Tomas. This was about 8.45 at night. 3rd of February, 1945 was a Saturday, all right? They came into the camp, they rolled up the main road of the camp, and they got to the main, the front of the main building. They had a little plaza there, it's still there. And Lieutenant Abiko, one of the, the second in command of the camp, came out to meet the tanks, and in the front of the tank, I believe, it was an Army Major with an M1 carbine. Well, Lieutenant Abiko, and there are various stories on this, by the way. This is one version. Lieutenant Abiko reached for something. He had a pack under his arm, and he started to reach for that pack. Well, the soldiers, American soldiers, were very wary of Japanese reaching for something because usually they'd have a grenade or something and try to blow them up, blow themselves up as well as with American soldiers. So this major, this Army major, immediately shot him with his M1. Now, he wasn't dead, but he was mortally wounded. He lay on the ground. Um, for the next couple hours, American civilians um, kicked and urinated on this man. Uh, they spit on him. Uh, one of the people that did this was a teenager by the name of Pete. Pete was a friend of mine. He since died. He said he did it. He was about 16, 17 years old at the time, I believe. He said he always regretted that for the rest of his life. He did not, he was not proud of that particular moment. Lieutenant Abiko died. My father took me to see his body under the stairwell uh, in the, uh, the main building. He was um, 
and naked from the waist up, the American medics had tried to save his life. They put his left arm into a sling. His body was covered with wounds and all kinds of stuff. He was a dead body. One of the men, one of the internees said to my father, did you want to bring this boy here? I was six years old. My dad said, yes. I still remember that, by the way. Um, <laughs> question? Irene, go. Wow, I hadn't heard that one. All right. To speak, so to speak, right. There are various stories of how Abiko went away. But she, there you go. There's an eyewitness right there. All right. Uh, okay. I'm going to do a couple more here. We were released but in an army truck. Uh, I don't know, 20 or 30 days after the liberation. Uh, I remember being on the back of the stake bed. It was a deuce and a half. I looked down into the swimming pool in Santa Tomas. It was half full. It was kind of covered with debris. And there was a dead cat floating there. And as a six-year-old kid, I was really concerned about that cat. And here we were surrounded by death and destruction in the city of Manila. And I was worried about this dead cat that had drowned in the swimming pool. I thought that was I ironic. We went back to our Boulevard Apartments where we lived before the war, uh, owned by my grandmother. It was on Dewey Boulevard, now called Rojas. It was uh, pretty much destroyed. There were uh, bullet holes all over the place. It was burned out. It had been bombed. There were three Japanese anti-aircraft uh, weapons in the front, uh, rifles on large, large guns, three-inch guns. I used to play on those guns, as a matter of fact. I used to go swimming in uh, uh, Manila Bay. It was only about 100 yards away, so our uh, uh, Filipino uh, assistant, employee, whatever, he would take me down to go swimming in the bay. And I had a, spe a, spe a specific spot that I swam in. That particular day, I couldn't go swimming because there was a dead body floating in the spot right there. Uh, Sophronio told my mother. My mother came to me and said, you're not going swimming today. I was not worried about the dead body. I was worried about going swimming. I was really angry with my mother because I couldn't go swimming that day. Uh, we had a dead body in the front of the hotel that, that the elbow was sticking out of the ground. The American GIs would tell me, as a young kid, whenever you go past that elbow, spin on it. So that's what I did. These were some of the things that went on. We're all done now. Okay. Michael, who are you going to be pushed out of the library? One other thing. We had about 200 yards off of our hotel a squadron of PT boats. And these were fantastic boats. They were all painted with shark's teeth on the bow. And uh, you can imagine what a six-year-old kid uh, saw in that. I was just really thrilled. Thank you very much. Mabuhai. Okay, I think it's someone else's turn now. So thank you for that wonderful story. Uh, yeah. <laughs>